21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. We've got her here. Agent, what did you say your name was? Yeah, we've got the note here, too. It was a 20. Yes, sir. Let me connect you with the command. You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. We'll hold the suspect here. What time will you be here? Okay. Yeah. All right. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was a quiet morning in the precinct until 11.10 when Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, rang into my office to inform me that the second alarm had hit on a fire on York Avenue. Before a car could come by the house to take me to the scene, the third alarm had hit. When I arrived, the fire, which was in a dry cleaning plant, was under control. The fire officer in charge told me that he had ordered the third alarm turned in as a precautionary measure because of the highly combustible material in the place and the proximity of the blaze to a public school. The fire was out at 12.10, and I returned to the station house to clean up my paperwork. At 12.35, I went out into the muster room, signed the blotter, and walked out the front door of the station house to take my meal in a restaurant on Lexington Avenue. As I turned the corner into Lexington Avenue, I saw a man in shirt sleeves holding on to the arm of a young woman. He struggled to get away as I hurried toward them. Oh, oh, no, you no. All right, what's the trouble here? Oh, don't. Oh, Captain, hello. Let me go. I'm right glad to see you. All right, what's the matter? You're hurting my arm. Please. All right, let her go, Mr. Sokin. She won't run away. I don't even know what I'm supposed to have done. You gave me counterfeit money. That's what you did. Counterfeit money. You did not. Look at this, Captain. Just look at it. Does this look real to you? Did you give him that $20 bill? I don't know whether I gave him that one. I gave him a $20 bill. I went in and bought half a cigarette. You bet your life you gave it to me. Where else would I have gotten it? When did this happen? Just now, Captain. Just this minute. Well, we'd better get inside your store and talk this over, Mr. Token. You're standing out here in your shirt sleeves. It's kind of cold. Yeah, it is. I'll agree with you. All right, let's go in. I don't see why I have to go anyplace. Well, you'd better come inside. Has, uh... You've been a customer before, Harry? I've never seen her in my life, Captain. Never. I don't have to be a customer. I wanted a pack of cigarettes, and I walked into a stationery store. I don't be a regular customer to buy a pack of cigarettes. All right, let's go in. What would I be doing with that? I don't know, but I'm not going to get stuck for it. Now, what happened? Well, I, I was right there, Captain. I was behind the counter, and she came in, and she gave me this phony I bill. I did not give you a phony bill. Well, what are you calling this? Look at it. Why didn't you notice it at the time? Yeah. Why did you wait until she got out on the street? That's what I'd like to know. Well, because she was talking to me. She was talking to Blue Street. I was just asking the best way to get to the Bronx from here. Yeah, and I keep telling her, but she don't understand, and I keep telling her again. Meantime, she's got the cigarettes, and I'm making change for the 20. Go on, search her, Captain. Search her right now. I bet she's got a fist full of them with her. I have not. Go on, go on, search her. I can't do that, Mr. Sokin. Well, this 20 is definitely a fist. You can see that. Anybody can see that. All right, now, just a second. We'll get it straight now. I'm willing to get it straight now. So am I. What's your name, Miss? Gloria Combs. Where do you live? 216 Perry Street. In uh, Greenwich Village? Yes. Yeah. Well, what are you doing in this neighborhood? It was past the 20 on me. That's what you I thought. was not. I was on my way to the Bronx. Well, this is a long way from the Bronx. I know it is. I took the wrong train at 14th Street. Somebody told me I should have gotten the 8th Avenue subway instead of the Lexington Avenue subway. So I got off and I came up and I was going to take the crosstown bus to get the 8th Avenue. That's why I got off here. Mm-hmm. What were you going to do in the Bronx? I was on my way to see somebody. Yeah, and on your way, you got to stick me for $20. I did not. You did come in here and buy a pack of cigarettes. Yes. And you did give him a $20 bill. Yes, of course I did. I gave him a good $20 bill. You gave me this. I did not. All right, all right. Now, uh, Miss Combs, would you mind opening your purse and emptying the contents out on the counter? Do I have to? Now, now we'll see something. No, you don't have to, but it would help. You want to see if I have any counterfeit in my purse. Is that the idea? If I have any more of those? 
That's part of it, yes. Well, I don't. Well, why don't you show us? Well, all right, if that'll get it straightened out. It'll help. <laughs> Perfectly ridiculous. Now, you see, there's the chase in the 20, Captain, that I gave her. But she didn't even have time to put it in the wallet. She was in such a hurry. All right. You can put those back in your bag. The lipstick and the comb. All right. And the cigarette. Uh, would you mind opening up your compact? There's nothing in there except powder and a powder puff. Well, would you mind opening it up anyway? All right. Thanks. Okay. Put that back in your purse. Now, look in the wallet, Captain. We'll get to it. Let's see inside your change purse, Miss Storm. There's nothing but change in there. Well, let's see. All right. There. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any identification in your wallet? Well, I got this card. You know, in case it gets lost. Please, Gloria, call me see if it's too safe. You have a driver's license? I don't drive. Do you have any other identification? No, that's it. This is good enough, isn't it? That's the identification I've got. All right. Can we see what bills you have inside your wallet? I don't see why I have to go through all this. I mean, honest to goodness. This is why you have to go through it, young lady, because you give me the fifth, that's why. I did not. Let's see the bills that you have inside the wallet. The money. Oh. Empty everything out of your wallet, if you don't mind. I don't have much. Mm-hmm. How much is that? Count it. Five, six, seven, eight, nine dollars. Now, look, I know I didn't give him that $20 bill. I, I, I just know it. I gave him a good win. I'm sure of it. But rather than stand here and be humiliated, I'll give him the $20. I'll, I'll just give it to him. Well, that's, that's a fair proposition. And I had to change from the 20 and $9 more, and I'll give him back his 20 I just know that the $20 bill I gave him was fine. It was perfectly good. Oh, I'm, I'm willing. I'm willing to let it go with that, Captain. I don't want to cause him any trouble. It's just that I don't see why I should get stuck with a fifth. Well, it's not that easy, Mr. Silver. Oh, it's simple enough to me if that's what she wants to do. Miss Combs, when you came in here and bought a pack of cigarettes, you had $9 and the $20 bill. You had $29, right? Yes, that's right. Why didn't you pay for the cigarettes with a $1 bill and sell the 20 I don't know. I just did. There's no law against changing a 20 is there? No. Oh, uh, Harry, take that pen and write your name and address across the face of the bill. What for? Just so you can identify it later. Oh, I can identify it. Go ahead. Write your name there. All right, if you say so. I just don't want to spoil it. Well, if it wasn't worth anything in the first place, you can't spoil it. Suppression of all counterfeiting of United States notes, coins, securities, and all other obligations of the federal government is the job of the United States Secret Service, one of the several law enforcement agencies of the Treasury. In accordance with the sections of the manual of procedure relating to such cases, I took the counterfeit $20 Federal Reserve note into my possession from Harry Sokin, the stationery store proprietor, and requested that the young woman he claimed passed it on him accompany me to the station house. There, when we walked into the muster room, Sergeant Waters was sitting in his desk office, and Patrolman Mercado was on telephone switchboard duty. All right, step right up to the desk, Sam. Captain. I mean, what's this all about? You're, you're not arresting me, are you? No, you're not under arrest. Where is uh, Lieutenant Gorman, Sergeant? Taking his mail, sir. Oh. Well, Harry Sultan claims this young woman passed a counterfeit $20 note on him. Yes, sir. I did not. I gave him a perfectly good $20 bill. Ring down to CB and tell them to notify the Secret Service. Yes, sir. Uh, have you got the note, Captain? Yes. Uh, hey, Mercado, give me CB on here. I think that's awful, causing such trouble for someone who comes into his store. A customer. Well, we'll get it straightened out. I hope so. Hello, CB. I only hope so. Sergeant Waters at the 21st. Did you notify the Secret Service that we're holding a counterfeit $20 note in the suspect? A suspect? Is that what I want? Okay. A suspect? Yeah. Well, that's the general description of you. Oh, I mean, this is a fine how do you do. I know I didn't give him any counterfeit money. I, I swear it. And even supposing it just happened to be. I mean, just supposing. Then all that been happened was somebody gave it to me and, and I didn't know it. And here I am in a police station under arrest. You're not under arrest. Well, at least I'm a suspect. That's what he called me, a suspect. I don't want to be a suspect. I really don't. Captain, there's Lieutenant King. On that, 
Hello, Captain. Uh, this is Miss Gloria Combs, uh, Lieutenant King. Miss Combs? How do you do? Lieutenant King is commander of the 21st Detective Squad. What's the trouble, Captain? You know uh, Harry Sokin? Warns the stationery, sir? Yeah. He claims Miss Combs used a $20 counterfeit note to buy a pack of cigarettes. Is that the note? Yeah. We'll take a look at it. No, yes, sir. I bought a pack of cigarettes with a $20 bill, but I don't know whether it was that one or not. Looks pretty good. Until you look close. I guess that's the idea. Sergeant, did you notify the Secret Service? Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Who's CB? I'd like to know what happens to me. After all, I can't stay around here all the time. I have things to do. You know, you just can't hold somebody in here with no reason at all. I, I mean, after all... It won't be too long. It's been too long already. I was so embarrassed on the street there. And then coming to the police station like this. I don't see what I did anyway. I'll tell you what you did. You had $9 and lots of change in your pocketbook. And you used that 20 to buy a pack of cigarettes. Well, what's that? I mean, you're not going to hang me over something like that. No, but you came pretty close to hanging yourself. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. People who smoke for relaxation are the most liable to relax themselves to death by smoking in bed. In spite of frequent warnings, some people go right on doing it and getting away with it until that one time. That's all it takes. They relax themselves to sleep, leaving unguarded cigarettes to smolder, to start fires, to claim their lives. Never smoke in bed. It's fatal too often for gambling. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Tonelli. Within five minutes, Sergeant Waters, acting as desk officer, received a telephone call from Agent Theodore Moss of the United States Secret Service, Treasury Department, which had been notified by the Communications Bureau. Sergeant Waters transferred the call to me, and I informed Agent Moss of exactly what had happened. He asked me to describe the counterfeit bill to him over the phone. I did. It was a $20 note on the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. It appeared to be a reproduction from a photo engraving. I gave him the serial number, the check letter, the faceplate number, the backplate number, and the series indicia. He told me that he was familiar with this counterfeit, that it had appeared in some quantity in the Chicago area and on the West Coast, that it was beginning to turn up with some frequency in the New York area. He said he would come uptown to the station house immediately and ask that we detain the young woman, Gloria Combs, so he could interrogate her. While we waited for the Secret Service agent to arrive, I took her upstairs to Lieutenant King's office in the 21st Detective Squad on the second floor. She complained that she was hungry, and I sent her the luncheonette around the corner for sandwiches. As she ate, Lieutenant King continued the effort to get some information from her. And how long have you lived at 316 Perry Street? Oh, they didn't put any mustard on this sandwich. I specifically asked for mustard. Yeah, well, that happens sometimes. Oh, I guess it's better than nothing. What did you say? I asked you how long you lived at 316 Perry. Oh, about a month, I guess. What have you got there, an apartment? You want to call it that. It's really just a furnished room. They call it an apartment. So where did you live before that? Hmm? Before 316 Perry? Excuse me. Yes. Um, that's as long as I've been in New York. Where'd you come from? Indianapolis. Are you working? Well, I haven't been. That's why I was going to the Bronx to see about this job. There was this ad in the paper for a key punch operator. That's exactly what I did back home. So I thought that would be ideal. Hmm. This is really kind of dry without my skin. I mean, they could have at least put a little butter on it. Have you been working since you got to New York? No, I really haven't looked. What have you been living on? Well, I had a little money saved, and I worked back home for a year without a vacation, so I had a vacation money, too. I mean, I'm entitled to a vacation, don't you think, for go look for a job? Why did you come to New York in the first place? Well, to be honest with you, there's this boy from back home. He's in the Coast Guard and he's stationed here. I mean, he's on a boat. When the boat comes in, it always comes into New York. We're, we're thinking of getting married. Well, this, this is really getting very silly. I mean, to be sitting on a police station like this, all because that stationary man's word. I didn't give him any counterfeit money. Where would I get it? You said you had a little money when you came to New York. How much did you have? What kind of Christmas? Well, we're just trying to find out where that bill came from. Oh. How much did you have? Well, after I got my ticket, there was about $250. Something close to that, one way or the other. 
You had that much cash when you came to New York. Mm, stop. Did you deposit the two hundred and fifty dollars in the bank when you got here? No, I didn't deposit it. I thought I needed to live on it. I've been using it to live on. I mean, what to use to deposit it when I I'd have to take it right out. Were there twenty dollar bills in that two hundred and fifty dollars? Sure, there were twenty dollar bills. There were twenty dollar bills and then tens and fives. Then you must have brought this twenty dollar bill from Indianapolis. Oh, I don't know. I guess so. I mean, I don't keep track of every bill. How do you like that? I know where I got it. Where? When I quit my job and got my last paycheck. It was for the last week of work and two weeks vacation pay. It was a pretty good check. I mean, it was about $150. Yes. Well, I was getting ready to come to New York, and I owed this little bill in the grocery store. So I gave him the check, and he took out the amount for the little bill and gave me the rest. About $135, $140 he gave me. That's why I must have got it. How do you like that? He didn't do anything like that to me. He's a friend of mine. Yeah, well, maybe he didn't realize it. You, you know what I like about sounds of New York? We get such good rye bread. I mean, they, they don't put so much meat on it they do back home, but I like the rye bread. Yeah. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. Mm, you want to call him? Yes, he's here. Captain Sergeant Waters on the line for you. Okay, thanks. 21st Precinct, Captain Canelli. Sergeant Waters, Captain. Agent Marsh of the Secret Service is down here at the desk. Okay, ask him to come up. He wants to know if he can meet you out in the hall first. All right. Outside the squad office at the head of the stairs. Yes, sir. I'll tell him. Okay. It's Marsh. He's here. Good. Marsh, who? Is that about me? It's the Secret Service man. My goodness, this is a lot of trouble, isn't it? All I did was buy a pack of cigarettes. Is he coming up, Captain? Yeah. Uh, you got to meet him out in the hall. I'll take them on. Yes. I can't help if that fell out in Indianapolis gave me that $20 bill. I'll be right back. Can I help something like that? That's not my fault. Mr. Moss? Yes. Are you Captain Canelli? That's right. I'm glad to know you, Captain. Thanks for helping us out. That's all right. Here's that note, he shouted. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's that Chicago stuff. What I told you about. How about the girl? What did she have to say for herself? Well, we've been talking to her. She says she brought about $250 in cash from Indianapolis a month ago. Mm-hmm. That's why she thinks she might have gotten it. Mm-hmm. She didn't have any more in it? No, there wasn't any more in her pocketbook. What she had in there was just what I told you, the change from the 20 and $9 more. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's a possibility there might be some more hidden in her clothing, but we'd have to book her and get a policewoman up here to search her. You want to go in? Uh, yes, sir, Captain. That way. Thank you. Are they keeping you fellows busy down there? Well, they've been getting busy since the 20s began to show up. Mm-hmm. Captain Canale. Come in. Go ahead, Miss Moore. Thank you. Lieutenant King, Mr. Theodore Moss. Moss, glad to know you, Lieutenant. And this is Miss Gloria Combs, Agent Moss of the United States Secret Service. How do you do? Gloria Combs, huh? Yes, sir. Well, that name is as phony as this $20 bill, isn't it? No. What gives you that idea? I mean, that's my name, Gloria Combs. When did you change it from Annette Spriggio? Me? Yeah, you. My name has always been Gloria Combs. I mean, I don't, I don't know what gives you the idea of something else. This does. This picture. Oh. And where's Phil? Did he come to New York with him? Now, look at that. Let's not waste any more time. You've been lying to these officers all morning. I know all about you, so let's have it straight. All right, if you want it straight. Uh, uh, where can I put this? It's a very good sandwich. Thank you very much. She and her husband, Mr. Phil Spriggio, have been shoving this stuff from Chicago on east. He made a good pinch, Captain. It wasn't his fault. It was that stationary store man. He kept screaming. He came on the sidewalk and grabbed me. Where's Phil? He gave an address, 316 Perry Street. Well, he's not there. You can count on that. Isn't that right, Annette? He's not there. I'll tell you how they've been working this. Her husband's got to take it down to some fine points. He gives her one counterfeit note, just one. She goes into a store and he waits across the street. She makes a small purchase and gets changed. Most of the time it works. 
She comes out, walks down the block. Her husband crosses over and they meet. He gives another note and she goes into another store. Well, not so close to the first one. Well, it has to be pretty far away. Yeah, well, the idea is that if the person she tries to show the counterfeit on screen, she says it's a mistake and gives back the money. Usually they take the money back. If they ever do call the cops on them, she gets no more counterfeit on the person. She rolls those sad eyes and says she made a mistake or somebody gave her the bill or some long, sad story like that. And she winds up hitting the bricks. It didn't work this time, better than that. No. Yes, it didn't. Where'd you get that name, Gloria Combs? I don't know. Just decided it was a nice name. Where are we going to find film? I don't know. Now, look, at that. We're not going to waste any more time with you. Where are we going to find them? I don't know. I have many ideas. Want to see you across the street when you went into that stationery store? Yes, you You think he saw the man come out of the store after you? I guess so. I mean, that's, that's what he's supposed to be over there for, to watch and see what happened. You think he saw me? Yes, I'm sure he did. Well, where is he? I don't know. Now, look. You're in here. He's out there. You love him enough to take all this by yourself? I love him. I love him plenty. I mean, he's my husband. Yes, but uh, what kind of marriage would it be with you in and him out? It wouldn't be any kind of marriage at all, would it? Where can we find him? Well, I don't know that exactly. I know where you can find his car. Where? He left it over there to be six. Not very far from here. On what street? I don't know exactly what street is. It's the next one after the street was the elevator train. Second Avenue? Yeah, I think so. Second Avenue. Where on Second Avenue? I don't know. I mean, not exactly. Can you show it? Oh, well, I can show it. But it's a shame. I think this is going to bust up on that. Well, don't worry about it. You were due for a long separation anyway. The counterfeiting suspect, an expert Joe, alias Gloria Combs, was taken downstairs and put in the detective squad car. After driving down 2nd Avenue twice between 79th and 57th Streets, he finally pointed out an auto repair shop. Lieutenant King and Agent Moss went into the place and talked to the proprietor. A car answering the description given by Annette had been left for repair and promised at 5 p.m. A plant was put on the place by detectives of the 21st Squad and Secret Service agents. The suspect in custody was returned to the station house and booked on charges of violation of Title 18, Chapter 25, United States Code. A policewoman arrived from the 19th precinct and searched the prisoner. No additional evidence was found on her person. Federal law put certain restrictions on the action of government law enforcement officers in making an arrest and searching a suspect without a warrant. These restrictions do not apply to New York officers operating under state law if they have reason to believe the suspect guilty of a crime. It was planned, therefore, that detectives make the arrest of Philip Spriggio with Secret Service agents assisting. Lieutenant King and Agent Moss were sitting in a parked car just up the block from the garage. Other detectives and agents were planted across the street and down the block. The suspect had not shown up by 5 p.m. At 5.20, he had still not arrived. What time does this fellow close up the garage? Six o'clock, he said. Said he told still there. Mm-hmm. Said he told him the car would be ready by five, but then he closes it at six. Mm, this is still doesn't make sense. He forget about the car. I'm not sure. Mm. If we make this collar, it'll cure an awful lot of headaches, huh? Hm. You're telling me. They're starting to hang that paper all over New York. We got the press and the plates back in Chicago about six weeks ago. Phil and his wife made a buy of this counterfeit just about three days before we got the place. What did they have to pay for this stuff? Well, the information we got shows they made a pretty good buy. Thirty cents on a the dollar. They bought a thousand of them. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm? Look at the man coming. Brown coat, brown hat. Yeah. Is that him? Wait till he gets a little closer. Yeah, looks like him. Yeah. Going in the garage. All right, let's go. Yeah, 
that's him. That's him for sure. Okay, let's get him. Sergeant Waters. Yeah? Well, who is it? His wife? Or do they live there? Or can somebody stop him from beating her up? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the blast ring. Or... The brass ring can catch anyone. 